Okay, applying Huygens Fresnel principle again to determine the direct fraction, the irradiance uh, distribution due to diffraction from circular aperture. So we start with uh, what we have done for single slit, which is written in this form. So for a circular aperture of area A, uh, what we do is uh, we will replace this term here, the amplitude term here, with Ea dA over R0. So now we have this uh, aperture, a circular aperture, right? And we will then uh, convert the integral, which in earlier on was just over the extent, linear extent of the slit width. Uh, but now we will then uh, integrate over the aperture area. In this case, what we do is we're going to uh, cut, divide the aperture area into strips and uh, uh, we'll talk about that in the next slide. And integrating over the entire area, so uh, with respect to dA, okay? Now this constant Ea here is actually a factor uh, that determines the strength of the electric field in the aperture, and dA would then be the incremental area, which is that blue part here of the aperture. Okay, come to that aperture, how we divide it. Now, this little strip has got a width of ds and is at a position s from the center, and this uh, aperture has got a radius r. So the area here is dA, and it will be given by x multiplied by ds, right? And um, then we need to find an expression for x respect to uh, r. And as, so here we have it. Now, x, uh, half of x is actually equal to Pythag from Pythagoras theorem. We have r squared minus uh, s squared will give us this length, right? And that's half x. So um, then that will be equal to two times root of r squared minus s squared. Okay. Then, um, so now the integral can then be written instead of a, um, uh, dA, we replace that with the uh, root of R squared minus S squared dS, and 2 is factored out over here. And uh, in order to integrate this, we're going to use uh, uh, some terms to make it simpler. So we use this substitution term, whereby the ratio of uh, S over the radius, the full radius here, is given by V here, and uh, gamma represents KR sine theta. And from this, we can then rewrite this expression with this expression in pink. Well, uh, from uh, this term here, we bring r out. So we have 1 minus s over r squared. Now, this term is v squared. So we have this term here now. And then um, from here, uh, dv equals to ds over r. So we have r dv d, uh, equals to ds, right? So Instead of ds now, we have r dv, so r dv, dv here. This r and this r has been factored out, so you get r squared here. And for the exponential term here, k s sine theta, now that would be equals to uh, k sine theta would be gamma over r, gamma over r. And we still have an s term, s is actually vr, so vr multiply that out. We have uh, gamma v, so we have gamma v here. Now, taking the integral whereby s is taken from negative r to r. So, if s is taken from negative r, v will be equal to negative 1. And to r, that will be r over r, that will be positive 1. So, we're taking the integral from negative 1 to positive 1. Now, this expression here is very special. It is a standard definite integral. So, a standard definite integral of this form has got a standard solution. And the solution is written in this way whereby the J1 gamma here is actually called the first order Bessel function of the first kind. And how does it vary? So let's go to the next slide. So this can be expressed, this Bessel function can be expressed by an infinite series in this form. And from the series expansion here, as gamma goes to zero, uh, J1, over, uh, J1 gamma here divided by gamma will have a limit of half. And this Bessel func function then will oscillate like a sine wave. But its amplitude will decrease as gamma gets larger. 
So you can see here, uh, in this case, it is that red curve, the red curve that represents uh, the first order Bessel function of the first kind here. Okay, and note where the zeros occur. Not the first one, but the subsequent one. Here is about three point something. Here is around seven. Yeah. So those are the zeros which will be important for us. So zeros of Bessel function uh, at different orders here will be given by this table. The one that we're interested in is when n is equals to one. The first zero occurs where, uh, where uh, this uh, gamma is equals to 3.832. Second one occurs at 7.016. And then the subsequent one all given here. Now that, we will just look at the first one, okay? So therefore, um, just now we had the uh, solution of the EV, uh, the amplitude uh, vary according to Bessel function. Then in that case, then uh, we can then write the irradiance will, will vary according to the square of this term here. Okay, and uh, I0 will be the irradiance when gamma equals to zero or when theta is equals to zero. So this is at the central maximum. Now, from the table of zeros of Bessel function just now, we, we, we note this value, 3.832. So in that case, a central maximum will fall to the first minimum falls to zero when gamma is equal to this value. And gamma before this, we have half k d. Uh, d is the diameter of the, the uh, aperture. Just now we wrote as kr, right, which was the radius. So now d divided by 2 here. And that's equal to 3.832, which means that now k is 2 pi over lambda, 2, 2 cancel. So you have a uh, pi over 2. Uh, sorry, 2 pi over lambda, 2, 2 can see pi over lambda. So you have d sine theta equals to 3.832 multiplied by lambda divided by pi. And this number divided by pi will give you 1.22. That's very special. So comparing the functions of uh, uh, the special function with the sink function that we derive for single slit. Now, both of them approach maximum when x is equal to 0. And their irradiances is the greatest at the center of the pattern when theta is zero. And the pattern is symmetrical about the optical axis that goes through the center of the circular aperture or goes through the center of the slit width. And then at first minimum, where m equals one for the slit pattern, uh, which we have uh, this function, m for for the circular function, you'll find that m, if, if you were to compare to that for the single slit, then it is equivalent or analogous to uh, m, the m prime equals to 1.22. So there is a factor difference here, 1.22 difference here, okay? How would this distribution look like? Well, here is uh, drawn the, uh, uh, the Bessel function that uh, we were considering, uh, squaring that term. So uh, the irradiance will vary this way. And this first minimum, yeah, uh, was determined when gamma first go to zero, right? So, and this will correspond to uh, angular half width. And um, if you look at the uh, image of the light pattern, uh, it will look like this. There's, uh, you see, this is much, much brighter than the others. So most of the intensity will fall at the, on the central maximum. And the, from here, the extent of the minimum here to here, this entire circle, bright circle, is actually called Eridis. And this is actually the diffracted image of the circular aperture. And the fringes are due to diffraction. Okay, so from the uh, previous equation, uh, which uh, gave us a d sine theta equals to 1.22 lambda. So the uh, far field, or rather the uh, front hole for diffraction uh, angular radius, that is the angular half width here 
of this every distance we can approximate it to because we are considering a small angle approximation so sine theta can be approximated to the angle but of course you don't write it in gradients so in that case then we will have uh, delta theta uh, because it's half of the entire spread here is half of it uh, and uh, so that will be because 1.22 lambda divided by d so we have this expression now this table here is given to you uh, whereby we have the ratio of the intensity uh, uh, distribution respect to the central maximum uh, written is given as uh, this uh, Bessel function uh, here squaring it. So you'll find that uh, this ratio of the intensity uh, will be, this is where all the zeros are occurring. But uh, the minimum, uh, sorry, the maxima, the secondary, this was the primary maximum. Then we had secondary maxima. This ratio is given as such. Uh, of course, this is derived from the Bessel function. So, but uh, you don't need to derive, we have given it to you in this table and where it occurs. Now, this is a quantitative example. Now, you are asked to find the diameter of the area disk at the center of the diffraction pattern formed on a wall, which is at a distance 10 meters away. And the aperture is circular and the diameter of the aperture is uh, 0 0.5 mm. So if you assume that the light has wavelength of 5, 4, 6 nanometer, okay? Next, and then you're going to compare this beam spread to that of a slit width of uh, 0 0.5 mm. So how are we going to do that? Let's look at this. Now, the angular radius of the airy disk, uh, we can then write it as 1.22 uh, lambda over d. So substituting lambda and d, we get it to be 1.33. Uh, my uh, no no milli radian, and uh, the radius of this every disc then uh, will be calculated as uh, the distance where we are observing at the wall, which is ten meters away, multiplied by this angular radius, and that will be thirteen point uh, thirteen mm. That will give us thirteen mm, right? Now the diameter then the diameter of this that is only the radius there. The diameter of this would then be twenty six mm. Now, when you compare to what we did in the previous uh, ex uh, lecture on single slit, I'm not sure whether this slide number has changed or not. Uh, you can check it out. Uh, we It worked out to be the same example. It worked out to be 21.8 mm. So in other words, now, the uh, circular aperture gives us a slightly wider beam spreading Yeah, by a factor. You will find out this by a factor of 1.22. This was single slit. This is from circular aperture. Okay? And we have a factor of 1.22. So corresponding, the corresponding linear width of this image at L distance would then be 2L, 1.22 lambda or D. Now compare this one with this one. So there is a factor of 1.22. So the circular aperture will give you wider spread. Now with that, uh, we're going to move forward to what we call the resolution. Because of this spreading, there will be some issue about resolution. Now, usually, uh, I mean, a telescope with a round objective lens will be subjected to this diffraction effect. It's similar to this circular aperture. So in other words, the sharpness of the uh, distant star that we are observing will be limited by diffraction and this image occupies the region of the airy disk. It is inevitable that there would be blurring effect due to diffraction and because of this it will restrict the resolution of the instrument which means that if we have two sources, okay, if the image has got blurring around the edge then how near can it be such that you can still resolve that it is from two sources? That's what we mean here. Okay, so if these two sources, if you bring it closer together, this pattern will then be brought closer together and then they start to overlap. How much overlap 
is allowed so that we can still see that there's distinctly two source, image of two sources. So this is variant. This rally criterion for theoretically for just resolvable images require that now the center of the image patterns must not be less than the angular radius of the LEDs. What do we mean? Now here, let's, let's bring it from far away. Now here, if you see, they're starting to overlap, right? But we can still see there are two distinct sources, so it can resolve. All right, we're bringing in nearer. Now this defines really a uh, really, really criterion, whereby you see that the maximum of the first uh, image falls on the minimum, the first minimum of the second image, right? And likewise, the maximum of the second image falls on the first minimum of the first image. This is the closest that they can come, such that we can still resolve that two, theoretically, we can still resolve that there is two, uh, the image is made out of two sources. This, of course, we can't resolve anymore because we just can't resolve anymore. So therefore, we can then define that the limit of resolution we will be, which will be given by this, determined by the every disk. So that will be 1.22 lambda over d. Okay, so that is the angular radius just now that, uh, that we defined. So d here can be the diameter of the objective lens of the telescope. Uh, let's look at more examples on resolution. Uh, here I compare uh, Rayleigh criterion for single slit and uh, circular aperture uh, due to diffraction. Yeah, so here uh, circular aperture has got a factor 1.22 here. Now, in the case of a microscope, the minimum separation between two objects such that we can just res we can at least be able to resolve them back, then uh, the, this it will be given by uh, the uh, what is the, the uh, criteria here uh, delta, uh, which is the theta minimum, and we multiply by the focal length. Okay, by the focal length of that uh, objective lens that has a diameter of D. And that will give us the minimum resolvable distance between the two objects that we wish to image. So if you look at this expression here, uh, this one, there's a limit of how close we can bring it down to. And uh, the diameter, of course, if the diameter is larger, then X mean will be smaller. That's very good, but we can't make a microscope which is so large. So uh, another thing we can do is play with uh, change this lambda. Okay. Now in uh, this microscope, usually uh, we have this uh, term called the numerical aperture, which is given by D divided by F, and typically it has a value of 1.2. So if Putting that in here, that will give us roughly x minimum, almost equals to the lambda. So that makes things easier as a comparison. So meaning that shorter lambda, that will give us better resolution. So if you use UV or if you use X-ray or electron microscope, that's why these uh, microscopes will have much better resolution and they can then this. This discern smaller distances as compared to the visible range uh, optical microscope. Now, come to your eye. How good is your eye at resolving things? Is there any difference during the daytime or during the nighttime? Now, like the microscope now, we do have a lens in our eye and um, in front of eye, I mean, in front of the lens, there is this aperture, which is the pupil. So your pupil can dilate at night or constrict and become smaller during the daytime when it's bright noon, especially. So uh, if you look at this uh, aperture here, now let, let's look at the equation. 
At night, our pupil is about 8 mm. So we say that uh, at night, we actually have higher resolution. Let's put it into the equation. 1.22 times lambda, we use the mid uh, value of the visible uh, range and divide by 8 times 10 to minus 3, that gives 0 0.84 uh, times 10 to my, uh, minus 4 radian. What about daytime? Daytime uh, at noon, bright light is about 2 mm. So that gives us about 3.36 times 10 to minus 4. So this is larger value. This is smaller value. So in other words, if this is larger value, that means these two objects must be further apart. But at night, these two objects can be closer together and we should be able to, uh, we, we can resolve better in other words. However, there's not enough light for us to take advantage of this ability to, uh, of higher resolution. So I would like you to try something. If you have, uh, you on a piece of paper, you just draw two lines, parallel lines, which are one mm apart, Okay, and then you stick it to the wall. Stick it to the wall. Okay, and then you stand back and you look at the two lines there. That how far away, how far away can you still resolve? You can see that there's two lines. You do a test for me, okay? Try it out. If we consider this uh, uh, angle here this uh, resolver angle, it will work out to be about three meters away. So you check it out and see whether it works or not. Just a rough estimate, okay, have fun. All right, now if we have a telescope, that's an objective of 50 cm in diameter, then we can calculate its angular limit of resolution, uh, taking again the mid wavelength of the visible range, uh, that will work up to be 0 0.28 arc second. And if we use this telescope and watch the moon, now the earth moon distance is 3.844 times 10 to 8 meters. So what are the possible images that we can see at the moon? Because the moon has got craters uh, and those, uh, uh, was it a trench and there are many, many features on the moon, right? So the what would be uh, the minimum distance between or uh, the minimum size of certain object that we would still be able to view it? So if we calculate using this, then we multiply by the distance of Earth to moon. That will tell us that any feature on the moon which is larger than 29.56 kilometers we should be able to see it, theoretically. And uh, if your objective lens has a uh, uh, focal length of uh, two meters, then um, the uh, corresponding distance between the images of the objects that you view on the focal plane of the objective would be about 2.68 microns. That is focal length multiplied by theta minimum, that is about 2.68 micrometer. Now, the pupil of your eye is 4 mm in diameter between 8 and 2, 4 mm when you view the images on the objective. So what is the furthest position of your eye from the focal plane such that you still, you would be able to resolve that two image? Then in that case, we will be doing this. We will be uh, doing, uh, getting as a uh, so in other words, we need to find this one instead. Or in previously, we were using L, so we need to find this. So that will be equal to S divided by this. And that will give you uh, uh, S is 2.68 times 10 to the power of uh, uh, minus, six, minus 6 times uh, D. D, which is a uh, four now this four mm yeah now is four mm uh, divide by one point two two lambda is five five zero 
and that will work out to be 1.6 cm. So there's a mistake here. So that would be the distance uh, that, will you, that you would uh, place your eye from the focal plane of the objective in order to resolve. Now here I have some fun for you. Uh, these are actually craters position. This is the moon image. And at different different position, uh, this is the near side of the moon that we can see. And at this red dot signify the position of where these craters are. And there are many, just some of the prominent craters are given here. Now they are all have uh, numbers next to it. These are the diameters of those craters. So based on the telescope that we were talking about just now, 50 cm diameter objective. So which of this crater can be resolved by this telescope? Uh, we just assume that uh, no, no air turbulence disturbance, okay? So have fun. All right, we have finished this lecture, learning outcomes. Uh, you should be able to apply Huygens' uh, uh, Fresnel principle to Fraunhofer diffraction of circular aperture and do the derivation to get the irradiance. And you should be able to explain what every disk is and you should be able to define and derive the resolution of optical instrument due to the diffraction limitation. And you should be able to state Rayleigh criterion and also determine the resol resolution of uh, various uh, optical setups. Uh, some of the examples we've gone through in detail.